All right. So here we go. So today I will be talking about ways that NRCS has been attempting to use some of the great data that we've heard about today. And we're all finding that budgets are shrinking and time in the field is costly and labor intensive. And so although we, in my opinion, have all have varying goals and objectives to the works products we develop and use, the core information we are all trying to collect to better inform our understanding and management decision making across our natural landscapes is essentially the same. So pooling our resources and sharing our data will, in my opinion, allow us to target and prioritize our resources within our own organizations by collaborating and using the data that's available um, like this data today. So. I plan to briefly touch on the definition of ecological sites. Um, I wanted to kind of just give you a feel for what ecological sites and ecological site descriptions are, some of the values um, to the documents and the concepts, and then go over state and transition models, and then go, go into a few examples and just some uh, quick ideas of ways I see the crosswalk of their data with the data that we collect and use to develop our ecological sites. Hey, Kendra, really quick, could you just introduce yourself and just really quickly? I don't know yeah. if we did that. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, <laughs> I'm Kendra Mosley. I am the NRCS Soil and Plant Science Division Regional Ecologist responsible for ecological site development in our Soil and Plant Science Division um, for regions two and eight, which are becoming the Southwest region, and it encompasses California, Nevada, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Hawaii, and the Pacific Islands, and part of all of no, Texas. Um, I used to cover the northern portion of the West Coast, which included Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. Uh, but those we've reorganized boundaries. So I'm now going to be covering more of the desert region. And I have been with NRCS for going on 15 years and been in California for most of them as either an ecological site field specialist, uh, a rangeland ecologist for the state NRCS. And for the past 10, 12 years, um, I have been in this position that I currently hold. How's that? Kendra, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next slide. So an ecological site. An, e an ecological site is defined as a distinctive kind of land from uh, with specific physical characteristics that differs from other kinds of land in its ability to produce a distinctive kind and amount of vegetation, and it's in its ability to respond similarly to management actions and natural disturbances. So in other words, an ecological site is a kind of land with similar potential and response to management. Our ESDs are the reports that characterize and document the ecological site concepts by synthesizing the existing knowledge, research, and associated data of an ecological site including climate, soils, hydrology, state and transition models, and the interpretations of that information in its characteristics in relation to land use planning and decision making. Ecological sites incorporate landscape characteristics like geomorphology, elevation, landform position, slope, aspect, and soil characteristics that drive or strongly influence soil temperature, soil moisture, and soil nutrient regimes. These in turn influence plant species responses, including distribution, abundance, and productivity. Our natural systems seldom include distinct boundaries in either space or time, and ecological sites include a certain amount of variability and uncertainty. However, the fundamental assumption for the ecological site concept is that locations with common soils, climate, and geomorphology can be delineated into units that support similar plant species, and respond similarly to management actions and natural disturbances. Land management and restoration are, often, are more effective when the landscape is categorized into more manageable parts. 
when the unique ecological processes and abiotic factors are identified and broken out into these manageable parts, it allows for more specific targeted management goals and objectives, monitoring plans, and assessments of successes and failures. The adoption of ecological sites helps to identify the appropriate management and restoration targets, and when they are developed properly, ecological sites bring together several ecological concepts, including plant-soil interactions, succession and climax, non-equilibrium and community structure, and the ecological gradients along spatial heterogeneity. Similar to the slide Rochelle showed uh, us this morning, <clears throat> our ecological sites delineate the patterns and relationships on the landscape, recognizing different vegetation expressions. But we take it one step further than just looking at the above ground portions. Ecological sites attempt to incorporate the soils and below ground functions that provide the foundational properties that result in those above ground vegetation patterns. And we've been addressing these types of soil vegetation relationships. Um, it's been a core of the soil surveys of NRCS and SCS before that, and have been um, since the inception of soil survey during the Dust Bowl era. And I chose this as one shot from one of our old manuscripts from Mendocino County uh, that actually is a diagram of the area that uh, Rosie talked about earlier in the oligotrophic wetland portions of Mendocino County and the Pygmy Forest. And you can see we, even back then, delineated out the landscape and the relationships between the different patterns and soils. We believe recognizing that the abiotic portion underlying the vegetation patterns is more static changing at a slower rate than the above ground biotic components that are rapidly changing due to numerous pressures and stressors that we are all extremely aware of these days in California, including massive fires, extensive droughts, et cetera, that can completely remove the vegetation and leave only a blank slate on the landscape. Connecting our vegetation to our soils and the relationships between them provides the key information for land management decision-making and monitoring and highlights where the limited funds we all work with can be focused to see better the most the best results possible making it easier to highlight ecological sites that may be vulnerable hard to restore resistant to disturbances or resilient and lower risk to disturbances As I previously mentioned, ecological sites are linked to our soil description and mapping process and databases and will be found linked at the component level. There will only ever be one ecological site linked to one soil component. However, our map units that you find in our soil surveys may contain multiple components, and these components may all have the same ecological site linked to them, or they may not. In these examples here, the stellar map unit has two components the stellar clay loam and stellar clay loam flooded, and therefore there are two different ecological sites, one more of an upland site and one that is more generally driven by hydrologic processes and greater water, uh, soil water availability. Whereas in the other map unit, the listed components are linked to the same ecological site. And in this case, it's most likely due to soil taxonomy differences that the vegetation doesn't care about at the scale of ecological site and soil mapping but the soil taxonomy does. So we also use a hierarchical, that word, a hierarchical organization to our mapping um, <clears throat> at different scales in order to successfully define and describe ecological processes, patterns, and anticipate ecological behaviors. Our major land resource areas or MLRAs and land resource units, which are sub to the MLRA, delineate the landscape to provide a defined set of initial boundaries across the country that will have the most impact on ecological sites within the MLRA or LRU. Each level of the hierarchy represents a unique set of attributes, scale, and products. Critical in the analyses and development of products at all levels is explicit definition of the concepts that distinguish individuals within a level. So for example, if we were to think about the Modoc Plateau, the NRCS calls that area 
Major Land Resource Area 21, the Shasta and Klamath Buttes and Valleys, which encompasses a large area of Buttes and Valleys within southeastern Oregon and northeastern California. It's defined by externally drained basins that cover a diverse mix of volcanic uplands, reservoirs, lakes, narrow valleys, isolated volcanic peaks and valleys along the east sides of the Cascade and Klamath Mountain ranges that are all characterized by precipitation patterns that deliver most moisture over the winter. So our ecological sites are differentiated, as I've mentioned, based on their ability to produce distinct kinds, amounts, and proportions of vegetation that respond similarly to disturbance. So therefore, our criteria for distinguishing between sites is evaluating the composition and function and structure of the vegetation, the proportions of species and how they pattern across the site, and their annual productivity, which is viewed through net primary productivity. If you're familiar with ecological sites or our older range sites, many think of this productivity data with respect to forage for grazing animals. The production that is collected and used to define an ecological site is not and should not be forage values and is not meant to reflect only grazing data. It's reflecting the full capacity of the site to produce growth in vegetation in a year and will depend on site and soil and climate characteristics. This production information serves as the baseline data that many calculations can be derived from. And those things would include calculating forage values, AUMs or stocking rates, for example. So an accurate description of the temporal dynamics of an ecological site is essential for identifying management goals and objectives, selecting and implementing actions, monitoring progress and assessing effects. A state and transition model is the preferred method for NRCS to describe these temporal dynamics of an ecological site. STMs display and describe the range of multiple stable states, which include unique combinations of biotic and abiotic attributes, and the transitions between these states, which include driving forces, ecological processes, and they reflect the potential for multiple stable plant communities to be present in one individual ecological site. A state includes one or more vegetation community phases, including <clears throat> associated dynamic soil properties that occur in dynamic equilibrium with a particular ecological site and that are functionally similar with respect to soil, st soil and site stability, hydrologic function, and biotic integrity. A state interacts with relatively static soil properties and topography that define an ecological site to produce persistent functional and structural attributes associated with characteristic range of variability. A state may include a number of different plant communities known as community phases, which are connected by community pathways. Community pathways describe the causes of shifts between community phases. Community phases can include concepts of episodic plant community change, as well as succession and seral stages. Community pathways can represent both linear and nonlinear plant community change. A community pathway can be reversible in part by changes in natural disturbances, weather variations, or changes in management. Shifts between states are referred to as transitions. Unlike community pathways, transitions are generally not easily reversible by simply altering the intensity or direction of factors that produce the change. Therefore, a transition from one state to another is often referred to as crossing a threshold. Transitions among states in an ecological site are often caused by a combination of feedback mechanisms that alter soil and plant community dynamics and contribute directly to the loss of a state's resilience. So the ecological site and state and transition models help connect the changes to a site due to disturbances of any kind through data, photos, narrative discussions, and literature synthesis. They describe and define recognizable plant communities or sets of communities that, that differ in ecological structures and related functions from other plant communities that may exist on the same site. Ecological function is defined as the way in which community processes water, energy, and nutrients. So the existence of states on an ecological site can be supported only by information describing these processes and how one state differs from others on a site. 
Each state has unique attributes important for decision making, such as resilience and the specific management actions and disturbance regimes that maintain that state or cross the site over a threshold to an alternative state. These transitions between states should emphasize the soil hydrologic and vegetation indicators that signal impending change and the dynamic processes that reduce the resilience of a state. Vegetation processes and dynamic soil properties are included in the description of a transition between states and examples of dynamic soil properties that change on a recognizable time scale can include soil organic matter, bulk density, pH, salinity, soil erosion, and aggregate stability. These properties parallel changes in plant communities and transitions between states, and they can be used to help understand the complexity and risk of transitions. The process and methods for differentiation and description of ecological sites involve several iterative steps that begin with foundation of numerous data points that are rapid and as capturing the full range of characteristics and variation, moving to more detailed data collection that fine tunes the ecological site characteristics, ending in focused data collection that captures all the attributes needed to fully describe the reference characteristics. So, here we have uh, at the bottom numerous data points collected through low intensity inventory techniques that are used to form rapid characterization of plant communities and associated environmental settings, which is then used to formulate the ecological site concept. Reconnaissance observations, traverses, and ocular estimates and photos will assist in helping to become familiar with the general features such as landforms, vegetation patterns, plant species compositions, surficial geologies, and soils. And the iterative stages include initial field sampling, analysis of data, defining ecological site characteristics, field testing of differentiations and modifications as needed. Differentiation of ecological sites and associated plant communities in reference or alternative states consists essentially of testing a working hypothesis. Our medium intensity sampling is intended to be a rapid process that focuses on environmental range associated with our general ecological site hypothesis. Relationships among disturbance processes, vegetation composition and structure and dynamic soil properties are all considered during that phase. And then the high intensity sampling provides that additional detailed information for the few sites that most typify each of the ecological site concepts that are established. They should adequately represent our central concept of ecological site properties. So here I just added a couple um, points to show where I personally view the data that VegCamp collects and where it fits in our process, especially if we return to the locations of their releve plots and gather a bit more detailed detailed soils information uh, and confirm the component that the data is related directly to in our database. If we only need to return to these locations to confirm the soils and link them to vegetation that was collected already, we significantly reduce the field time required to build and refine these concepts for an ecological site. The rapid assessments would also assist us in, conf in confirmation and creating a better amount of data to test the extent of variation across each ecological site. So our ESDs or the e ecological site descriptions include a lot of plant tables uh, that describe site characteristics, ground cover, canopy structure and percent cover and height classes, plant species compositions and the annual production values. Uh, by species and by functional groups. And uh, when they're in the forested systems, we also include site index and DPH. As well. so, uh, I wanted to show that and then compare it to the sheets we saw earlier from Rochelle that gather all of that same information. <laughs> So this is a map of the data points from our ecological site data collection um, that include in the pink or purple dots uh, soils point data where our soil scientists have gone out and collected a soils description or confirmation pit 
The yellow is where our ecological site specialists have gone out to collect vegetation data collection using our protocols. And the blue dots are from the VegCamp data that um, I overlaid on top of our soil map unit, um, our soils map units, so that we could go in and actually look at some of the data all together. You can see um, one of my goals is to find a way to use these already described soils and use the data to fill in uh, some of our vegetation data gaps where we weren't able to visit and build concepts or improve the data sets for concepts we've already developed. Opportunities like the one inside the yellow circle provide us with opportunities to improve our data sets without necessarily revisiting the locations in person, reducing time and travel investments while still providing us with essential data. And so you can see here when I overlap the layers and uh, open up the attribute table, I can now see that our soil map unit called Lofer Creek Gopher Ridge also has one of their data points that was associated with the Quercus de Glossii um, association. And if I go back to our ecological site, uh, we have a blue oak ecological site concept that was developed for that with only two points. So now we have one more data point we can use to uh, refine that concept and improve the data set. And just like VegCamp data that goes into an access database, uh, our soils information and our vegetation information goes in our National Soils Information System database. Uh, they're both access database derived. Ours is a little bit bigger and more complicated, but uh, provides us an opportunity to find ways to crosswalk the data and share the data within our databases and look at them spatially. And then we have the uh, information that goes into our ESD after it's all collected and analyzed and evaluated and the concept has been fully formulated. The ESD is written and the state and transition model is developed. This is just an example from one of our ESDs. And the information that Rochelle mentioned earlier uh, that they put in their reports, um, is a similar type of process and would both provide us with vegetation pan, uh, patterns that support and complement and improve the information that we provide in our ecological sites. So some other ways, easy ways to use the associations and alliances is to provide further confirmation of the various states and community phases within our state and transition models. Augmenting the data that we collect to support the reference state community phases with the data and information from the vegetation mapping data and reports assists us in building better, more data supported state and transition models. And Rochelle mentioned earlier about uh, the special project they did with Juniper expansion. So it would be really easy to pull out all of the data based on the process um, Rosie showed us of identifying where the Juniper expansion has been noted and what the age classes are, and that could help us identify which data plots perhaps need to go with which community phases in our same transition model. Other ways to use the associations and alliances is just to provide further confirmation of the various states and phases. Oh, I think I already said that. Um, with the smaller budgets and limited time for field work, it is even tougher to gather the data to describe all of the alternative states and community phases as well. So many um, start as evidence and literature supported only. Um, we don't generally have a lot of time or data collected yet for some of the alternative states. The problem with that is that many land managers and ecologists in California are operating in these alternative states and could really use that data to define these states and community phases as well. So digging of the associations in state two and dropping those points on a map to evaluate where they fall on our soils maps and with our soils data could rapidly improve the descriptions and data provided for that state in the model, providing better data and baseline or baseline land management decisions. And lastly, 
<clears throat> Our ecological site descriptions also include rangeland health reference sheets that are uh, described in the Interpreting Indicators of Rangeland Health Handbook. Rangeland health is intended to be used at the ecological site scale or equivalent landscape unit using the ecological site descriptions and their site specific state and transition models to inform and develop the reference sheet descriptions and ecological reference areas when available to conduct our assessments of rangeland health. This information includes descriptions of plant cover or production potentials, describes ty typical bare ground, functional and structural groups, litter and invasive plants all information that can be gleaned from the vegetation mapping data that we've seen today. Many of California's ESDs still do not have their rangeland health reference sheets developed along with the ecological sites and ESDs, and so this could be another opportunity for us to improve our rangeland health reference sheets in California. And that is all I have for you today. Um, I hope you found it interesting and useful, and if you would like more information about ecological sites and ESDs, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. That was great, Kendra. Yeah, I see a thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh -oh. If if um, <laughs> <laughs> if Veg Camp could collect soil data, what would that be? Soil data that would help you. Well, as I showed in the in the pyramid, um, the rapid assessments, you know, don't generally need a whole lot more than what you already collect. But mm -hmm. at the releve level, um, usually what we do is dig enough of an auger hole that we can confirm uh, the component as it's described in our database or the soil survey. Um, and then we also, you know, note at what horizonation levels certain um, soil profiles have and rock fragment content and that kind of thing um, as ways to make sure we're we're capturing the things that matter most to um, how the soil and site functions uh, ecologically. So we generally need a bit deeper uh, and more complete description, but it doesn't require a ton of data. We've talked about this some in our vegetation committee meetings about what would be uh, required and I don't know that it would take a whole lot of time. It would just be more of a training aspect. Mm -hmm. um, but I think yeah, it's kind of like a pit. You have to dig a little a little pit, right? To measure yeah. things and whatnot. Yeah, how yeah. big is the auger that you carry? Oh, the augers generally go to about four and a half feet to five feet. Or the ones the soil scientists carry around um, can be extremely long and come in like three different pieces and some of their, you know, shovels that they need to get through some of those argillic clay soils are pretty ridiculous to carry around. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, uh, do job. <laughs> what was that, Brian? Oh, just not something that we can easily carry in the field with us. No, no. I mean, what we I thought in our veg committee was that we would need to have like basically like a soil scientist along with the crew, right? I mean, it's sort of like at that mid to upper level of your of your um, triangle that you shot, showed. Mm. Yeah, or at least someone that's been trained well enough to know enough about the soil to be able to get that information. Um, we asked a lot of our range cons to do this kind of work in the field when they do the NRI range inventories. Um, so they've they've had to be trained and there's actually a protocol in the NRI range inventory on how to do soil confirmations. Uh, so I think there's a process already in place that would be easy to to use. Mm -hmm. But uh, NRCS also has a resource soil scientist that, you know, could potentially offer assistance and stuff like that. Um, and like I said, some of it is it can be done post visit as well if we are aware and can return to the same location oh, right uh, yeah so we could do something to that effect as well and about how long does it take once you're at the site i know it probably depends on the soil type but generally yeah. uh, it really does depend on the t or depend on the type of soil. Um, although, if you have a really shallow to hard pan, 
um, you can't get much further than that without needing a backhoe or something to dig it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you have information about the soils already on hand, so you know you what soils to set to select from to confirm, mm -hmm. it's pretty quick. If the information is a little harder to get to you and you just are out there trying to describe it and figure out what you're looking at, it can take longer. Um, I'd ballpark, you know, 20 minutes of, of extra time in a data collection protocol to, to do the soils confirmation part. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh-huh. Any other questions? Any questions specifically for Kendra? I see a question, um, Michael Vassi. Yes, I just wondered uh, to what extent <clears throat> you investigate uh, wetland soils, and I'm really interested in like tidal wetland soils or soils from diked wetlands. You know, it's great that you ask that because that has risen in our agency nationally as something that needs to be more um, had more time spent on it. We have a special focus team in our division called the Coastal Zone Mapping Team. And they've actually started looking into this um, over on the eastern side of, of the country. Um, so there is some work being done in recognizing how that protocol and process will work to maybe even address uh, subaqueous soils where we're right now struggling is that it's a fairly expensive process with you know needing a lot of specialized equipment and so we've been working on building up that possibility or potentially you know sharing that um, responsibility with our partners that have some of that equipment and trying to get some of that accomplished but it takes a little bit more in our agency and the way we work um, it takes a lot of outside pressure to push our agency to move forward on on the needs of outside individuals right going to our california nrcs and expressing interest in having that information would would fast track that in california very quickly okay thank you very much you bet and i would be happy to work on some of that it's areas that i find extremely interesting and would love to do more in Super. So quiet. It is quiet. It's deceptive, it I think. Um, so different than doing an in-person meeting, right? Yes. <laughs> well, thanks, Kendra. This this has been like joy. I like. I learned things. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so this, that was great. And um, I want to thank everyone who came. Um, I also want, um, we mentioned a couple of times um, that there are going to be follow ups and I'm just going to reiterate what we plan for these for the follow up meetings. Um, Andrew Johnson is going to present um, on how to how to use the vegetation data in um, emergency stabilization um, work for BLM. Um, we are planning on doing a more in-depth um, uh, training on sensitive natural communities. And we also want to put together um, a presentation that involves, that highlights the work that was done with this data on, on um, bird distribution, but also um, other um, habitat um, focused uses of vegetation data. Um, so feel free to uh, contact me if you feel like you might want to participate in, um, like actually present on a habitat based one. Um, and we will um, see about, uh, you know, getting one together soon. Um, and finally, I want to ask Julie, I know that there's something planned for CNPS that m could interest maybe some people here. So if you want to um, mention what um, what uh, CNPS is going to do um, training wise, that would be great. 
Yeah, actually, I think that Betsy could speak to that. Betsy, you're on a little, or Jennifer, um, since they would be the ones who are um, presenting that, at least the upcoming one. Yeah, um, uh, Jennifer, please jump in if I'm misrepresenting, but um, we want to do build off of what Rosie was doing in terms of sh uh, demonstrating BIOS and taking people through um, live exercises um, and interacting with that data, as well as showcasing the Manual of California Vegetation and how to interact with that data as well, um, using real world examples. All right. Do we have a, is there a date for that one yet? That one is likely in November, correct, Jennifer? From what I believe, I mean, it, yeah, it hasn't been scheduled yet, Rochelle. Scheduled. I, I think that CMPS is trying to get some uh, information from the general public about interest in a variety of workshops that would be one of various workshops. So I think that they're trying to get some input right now to switch towards some digital, digital you know, online workshop presentations. Do we have time right. for one more question? I have one from Darren about um, VegMap. Sure. Uh, so maybe clarify how the geology layer was used to inform the vegetation map um, and whether you use a soils layer in um, vegetation mapping. I think there might be some confusion around the allocation versus the vegetation map. Um. Yeah, and I, for the MODOC, I didn't actually use a soils layer. When we did an allocation for um, the Great Valley, um, we did. And when we did a mapped Mendocino Cypress, we, we used Sergo data. Um, but, in, it, um, but then, yeah, in terms of um, other uses for s soil info, I'm actually going to defer to the mappers, to GIC and AIS, who've done some of the work. And I'm curious, do you guys do you guys bring up soils map and 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 make use of them um, in in kind of creating your like mental models for how you determine what vegetation types there are? You know, I, I've tried bringing the um, state soil layer in, it's just way too coarse most of the time and not very helpful. It's just uh, easier to use Google Earth and tilt it around and uh, just look around that way. Um, yeah, I wish it was finer and a little bit more um, current, but maybe that's happening. I don't know. Yeah. And I would just say, and maybe in the broad view, that there are certain geology layers, depending on the study area, that help inform kind of broader scale sets of alliances that would be mapped in an area. Um, it can be useful, and I think it's just a project by project basis. Yeah, is John Mankey on still? You could maybe speak to if you use soils um, or geology. Maybe not. I'm not sure he's still on. Yeah. Well, I know that um, geology could be used to stratify for sample allocation, um, and maybe that would help inform, you know, those um, those units that Kendra was referring to. So maybe I mean, is I think that might be what he's referring to specifically stratify on um, soils rather um, so that we know that we are sampling in, in um, widely distributed, you know, all the different type, soil types within the study area potentially. And I think we've done that before, especially yeah. if for, um, you know, soil types that we know drive vegetation. Yeah, I was just going to pipe in um, when he said state soils map, did he mean NRCS maps or some other kind of soils map? And Sergo or Statsco? Yeah, the yeah. Statsco. Oh, Statsco? Well, I could see how Statsco wouldn't be very useful to you, but um, 
hopefully the Sergo level data is is easier. Um, I also I think you know where NRCS has maybe lacked some uh, what's the word some time and staff I guess to um, helping people interpret how to use our maps too, which I think um, is part of the issue is I don't know that it's always clear how to interpret the data within our map units and um, maybe an opportunity to do some more trainings on how to use the maps uh, that are currently available um, could be done. Yeah. Hi, this is John from AIS. Hi, John. You want to say hi. how you hi. use soils? Layers? Yeah, not specifically for MODOC so much, but we're using serpentine geology, even though it's a little bit more generalized for the Marin project. And we have used soil maps for predicting um, Arctostaphylus types and other coastal locations. Um, so we, we do use those. Uh, a lot of times they're a little bit too generalized for our mapping, though. Yeah, kind of how Brian just said. Yeah. Great. Thanks, John. Okay. And we do have one more question, unless uh, I don't want to move on, unless. Does that feel okay. answered? Okay. Um, <laughs> how is there a mailing list, Rosie? How can people stay in the loop on the other talks, like the Bureau of Land Management topic on post fire? Um, so everyone that accepted the meeting, which included people that we didn't have originally on the list, I put in a spreadsheet. So I, I have that and we would use that for any, um, any of these future ones. Um, but also, if you want to make sure that you're on the list, um, please go ahead and um, like put your information in the chat and we'll, we'll make sure that we add you to the list. Well, if that was the last question, um, thanks so much to everyone who um, did the work to get this presentation ready. And um, thanks to everyone who showed up and uh, showed some interest in um, this new veg, you know, new vegetation project, and hopefully this will help you um, help you make good use of the data. Yeah, and we'd love your feedback. Um, maybe we can do a like a post survey about use usefulness of all this data, and if there was something you, we thought you thought that maybe we skipped or or what. Yes, that would be good. Let's send out a little survey and get some information how we can do better what we missed yeah great thank you rosie for putting this all yeah, together thank you. yeah that was great thanks for all the coordination that you did uh, behind the scenes and in the scenes <laughs> yeah. great thanks rosie thanks rosie all righty